All right, so welcome to our last uh, session uh, here, uh, session nine. Um, uh, chapter 21, uh, just as we, as we look at this, uh, chapter 21, I mentioned this uh, a few weeks ago, uh, but when you look at this, it, it's almost a postscript uh, chapter. Uh, it's a uh, supplemental information that was not intended originally to be part of the gospel. Uh, and uh, once again, it was, though. It was included in the gospel. At no point in the history of uh, discovering the ancient text of the Bible did they ever find a, a gospel of John that omitted it. So it was actually part of the original gospel, but it seems like this, chapel, this, this chapter uh, wasn't intended by the Apostle John initially uh, to be included, but he included it at the end. And we say that because we ended last, I know it was two weeks ago, but we ended that with that conclusion. Remember, John kind of writes this conclusion, uh, Jesus and many other things that were not recorded in this Bible. It's almost like he's concluding his gospel at that point. Then all of a sudden, here we are again. He's given us another uh, episode, another occurrence. So that's why we kind of think this is a, a postscript. A couple of things within the text that kind of make us think about that. Now, don't let this confuse you or to think that this is contradictory or anything. But it's just important to understand uh, how this was, uh, came about. Uh, in this uh, chapter, he omits uh, this uh, idea of Jesus appeared on a seashore with how many disciples? Seven. So seven. Wow, guys, that's the easiest question I was going to ask you today. So, Jesus appeared to the seven disciples in Galilee on the seashore. Uh, the Apostle Paul in chapter 15 doesn't uh, even reference that. The Apostle Paul, as he's writing chapter 15, the great resurrection chapter of Corinthians, uh, he talks about how Jesus appeared to Cephas or to Peter, and he appeared to the twelve, and you know, talks about the large group of disciples Jesus appearing, but doesn't reference this smaller group. So that's one thing that people kind of think about. Also in this uh, chapter, verse 2, is kind of an odd, an odd thing. If this, is the, if this is John himself writing this, uh, he is referring here to two of the disciples as the sons of Zebedee. Why is that odd? Because he is one of them. And John in his gospel, we've talked about this over the, over the weeks, he, he stays away from biographical stuff. He normally stays away from any of that. Uh, he doesn't even refer to himself, does he? He refers to himself in the third person as the disciple of Jesus loved. That's how he refers to himself. So it's kind of odd that he would include in this chapter of uh, this sons of Zebedee, because he never uses that expression elsewhere in his gospel. Verse 20, um, which we'll look at here in a little bit, Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. And then there's this, in the, in the actual scriptures, there's this uh, parenthetical this was the one who had leaned uh, back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? This is common in the Gospel of John. He refers to himself as a disciple. Uh, who, who, but this last part is just it's a strange addition. That if John is writing this, why would he say, let me clarify who that disciple is whom Jesus loved? Uh, so it's kind of a strange thing. And then the last two verses, which we'll look again uh, here shortly, uh, this is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. And then Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Uh, who's the we? We're going to talk about that. This is uh, uh, If this is John writing, why does he say we know that his testimony is true? We're getting to it. We'll get to it. <laughs> I don't want to hypothetical. It. Hypothetical. Not hypothetical. It's rhetorical. There you go. We'll get to it. I'll call on you next when we get to that. Point. <laughs> so, so the fact that he includes this "we" uh, kind of makes it seem like that's kind of a strange way. And then also down here, he says "I." I suppose. Once again, John doesn't use "I we" in his gospel. Uh, he doesn't refer to himself in those terms. So that's why I think traditionally uh, people that kind of see this last chapter as not necessarily written in hand by John himself. However, uh, we think it was probably written by a presbyter or, or even John by that age, uh, 90 years old, whatever, the last uh, surviving apostle had disciples. Uh, people that followed John and heard John's word and then took that message out into the world. And so it's possible that these disciples or presbyters in Ephesus 
I heard John share this resurrection account and then asked him to have it included. So he's already kind of, if you follow this train of thought, he's already kind of summarized his gospel at the end of chapter 20. And then his disciples come on and say, you told us about, remember when you told us about the, uh, uh, when uh, Jesus was fishing, on, or not when the disciples were fishing and Jesus appeared on the shore. Remember you told us about that, John? We, we probably need to put that in there. Because that's a very important uh, reference. And then, uh, and either, uh, and so John probably told a story and somebody wrote it down and then stuck it in. That's, that's a long seven minute discussion over something that really isn't all that important, <laughs> except just to understand um, the context. Okay, so here's the actual account. Uh, the Sea of Tiberias, which is also called the Sea of Galilee. Here's a map of this. Um, here's the Sea of Galilee. Uh, the Jordan River goes down here. Uh, these are familiar towns to us. Here's Nazareth. Uh, here's Cana, uh, which is the first miracle. Uh, over here is Bethesda, uh, which is where... Uh, and John, John says in this gospel, that's where uh, Philip was from. Also where Peter and Andrew were from, from Bethesda. But Capernaum here is kind of the home base uh, for Jesus and his disciples. Uh, so they're at the Sea of Galilee. Why did the disciples travel to Galilee? This is after the Easter. Why did the disciples travel to Galilee? Now, they're from there. The angel told them. Uh, and also uh, Jesus told them. Uh, to go to Galilee. Uh, uh, and so the disciples, now here's the seven. Uh, once again, it says that uh, these are the disciples, this is how the event came, un, un, you know, came about. So you have Simon Peter is mentioned by name, Thomas is mentioned, uh, also John includes the, uh, kind of the second name for Thomas, or the nickname for Thomas, he's called Thomas Didymus, and Didymus when translated means twin. So it's pretty evident that Thomas has a twin. We don't know if it's a twin brother, twin sister, fraternal, fraternal, whatever all that is. Uh, and it's never mentioned in the Bible. We have no idea who the twin is. Uh, but he's referred to as Thomas the twin. Uh, Nathaniel is present. Um, and then John tells us that he's from Cana. Uh, and then the sons of Zebedee are mentioned. Remember I said that earlier. Notice what John doesn't say. He doesn't say who they are, but we know who they are. Uh, we know who the sons of Zebedee are. Uh, so he's included the sons of Zebedee in this list, um, and then two others. Now, if you were a reasonable person, you'd just move on. But since I'm leading, I, I, I have to think about this a little bit more. Who are those two others? That's where my brain goes, maybe not yours. And it doesn't matter, uh, really, the answer. But I'm going to tell you anyway. Uh, so let's just look at this. Uh, in the Gospel of John... He actually says some of these names. He actually literally tells us the name Simon Peter, and those are the reference points. He talks about Thomas. He mentions Thomas by name in this gospel, and he mentions Nathaniel by name in this gospel, uh, and then he mentions a few other disciples by name, and the thought process here is if he's mentioned them by name, and they're included in these two others, then why doesn't he say their names? If he's already introduced them in his gospel... Why would he not just say, these are the names of the two other people? So the ones that he mentions in the gospel by name are Philip and also Andrew. This is kind of a tricky one, because who's Andrew's brother? Peter. Peter. And Andrew and Peter were fishermen by trade, uh, but he's not mentioned here as part of the seven that are going fishing this day. So he could be part of the two others, but it's odd that John wouldn't just say Andrew. He's talked about Andrew before. And he's, uh, he, the ones he hasn't mentioned were Matthew. We never hear Matthew's name in the entire gospel. Or Simon the Zealot. Uh, James the son of Alphaeus. Uh, or Thaddeus Judas, uh, the son of James. Uh, we don't hear those names mentioned in the gospel. So some have speculated that since uh, he hasn't introduced them yet in the gospel, that's probably why they're referred to as the two others. He didn't want to take the time, or the, whoever's writing this, the elder, uh, didn't want to take the time. Okay. That's right. Yes. I, I, I had my mind, Galilee was like a city. Yeah. It's an area. So where does Jesus, when he's telling them to go to Galilee? Uh, I mean, he's in Jerusalem. Yeah, they're in Jerusalem. Was it down in Judea? Down here. Yeah. Down. Right down here. Yeah. 
down here by this. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, he's in Jerusalem. I'll meet you in Galilee. And the angel, as you said earlier, some of you said the angel said he'll see you in Galilee. They're in Jerusalem. Uh, and so Peter says, um, I'm going fishing. So they're up there, the seven of them, and Peter says, you know, we're in Galilee, let's just go fishing. And he hasn't fished probably for what, three years. Uh, and we don't even know if any of these rest of them even have any fishing experience, except for the sons of Zebedee. So they fish all night, and they caught nothing, nothing. nothing. not a zilch, zero. They caught nothing. Uh, they see Jesus standing on the shore, but they don't know it's him. Why? It's too far away. Exactly right. This is a little bit different. Than, remember, um, the, the Emmaus disciples didn't know it was Jesus. Why? He was, they were kept from recognizing him. Almost by divine intervention, they didn't know it was Jesus. What about Mary? We talked about this two weeks ago. Mary Magdalene, who's at the tomb, weeping and, and grief, and she finds somebody be standing behind her, and she immediately thinks it's the gardener. Why didn't she recognize Jesus? Grief. Grief. So much sorrow. And, and, and But here, uh, I think it's obvious, as Doretta said, they're 100 yards away, uh, and they're young men. You know, in their 30s. Uh, but seeing 100 yards, and could you see 100 yards and figure out that person on the end of the, and who that is? Him, him too. That was early morning, right. So what happens after that? They, uh, they see this person on the shore. They don't realize who it is. And maybe they see the smoke coming off of the, the grill that he's got going. He's got a foreman grill, not a foreman, but a foreman grill. What's a, what's a grill that's out there? Weber, Weber. Weber, that's what I was thinking. He's got a Weber grill going. And uh, they smell, no, okay. Um, what happens after this? He says something to him. What does he tell him? Throw your nets down. I haven't caught anything. Yeah, have you caught anything? You throw your nets down on the right-hand side of the boat, which is what you, you never, never tell a fisherman what to do. They come in empty. The last thing they want to hear is your solution. Uh, but he does. He says, throw your net or, on the other side of the boat, on the right side of the boat, and they do, and what happens? Yeah. Yeah. It fills up with fish, uh, and even counted later, uh, lots of fish, so much that the boat was almost ready to sink. Uh, uh, why was this familiar to them? Because they did it once before. Yeah, he did it once before. When? The very beginning of his ministry. Okay. The very beginning of his ministry in Luke chapter 5. Uh, they're out fishing. They catch nothing. This is probably James and John and, and Peter and, and, and Andrew. They catch nothing, uh, and they, this, Jesus is on the shore, and he says, Hey, try it on the other side, and they catch on it. Okay. So this is, should be familiar to them. Uh, and it was to one of them. Who was the first to recognize that this person on the shore Peter. is Jesus? Peter. Peter. <clears throat> John. 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 Oh, okay. Yeah. The disciple whom Jesus loved recognized that it was Jesus, and said, it's Jesus, it's the Lord. And then, then Peter. Then Peter jumped on. Okay, we did this last week. I think it's okay to think in these terms. Peter and John were friends, like close friends. And you remember the whole episode of Racing to the Tomb? And remember how I talked about how that must have been one of those stories uh, that John would say, hey, Pete, you know, who, who got to the tomb first? I think this might be one of those stories, too, where we're all standing around gawking, and, and John's like, <clears throat> I knew it was Jesus. Nobody else did. And then once I, you know, I saw this. It might have been a little bit more, not as dramatic as that. But <laughs> what did Peter do after the first time? This is back in Luke. What did Peter do after the first miraculous catch at the beginning of the Jesus ministry? What did Peter do? Remember? He to walk on water. Not that one. Just not, that one. not yet. Not yet. Not before that. He fell to his knees and said, get away from me. I'm a sinner. He recognized at the moment in the boat that he was standing in the presence of God. Because only God can just miracle wrap and So it's just, uh, get away from me, Lord, because I am a sinner. That's Peter's response to that first miraculous catch. Uh, what does he do now, the second miraculous catch? He doesn't hide the boat. scared, does he? He jumps out of the boat and does what? Swims 100 yards while the rest of the six of them are trying to bring in the fish. And he gets there first. And 
probably reminded John of that, didn't he? I'm an old man swimming 100 yards, and I still beat you guys. And John's like, well, the boat was heavy, Pete. We had... Okay. So what does he do? He, he, he doesn't uh, fall to his knees in terror or fear anymore. Instead, he races to go see the Lord. So uh, why do you think there's a different response here? What's different about this situation? They're more knowledgeable. Yeah, three years of mm -hmm. being with Jesus. What else? We've been through the crucifixion and resurrection. Yeah, the resurrection. The tomb is empty, and he's appeared in the upper room. And they know, and, Jesus, and Peter knows that Jesus is risen. So uh, there's, uh, and maybe there was a, um, I guess you could probably say, an eagerness to get to Jesus. Uh, uh, because he had, you know, all the stuff that Peter had been through internally, emotionally, because of his denials, maybe he was just eager to get to Jesus. Um, what does Jesus have waiting for them when they arrive on the shore? Some fish and bread. They've got the fish grilling. Um, and, uh, and this is the breakfast of champions. This is, this is literally what's going on, right? The breakfast of the champion here, Jesus, has breakfast ready for them, uh, which is another reminder, and he eats with them. Is a reminder of what about him and his resurrection? The physical resurrection. He's alive physically. It's not a ghost. Ghosts don't eat fish. Real people eat fish. And Jesus is still real people, uh, glorified in his body. So um, Jesus reinstates Peter. Sometimes this is referred to as uh, Jesus re forgives Peter. That's not what's going on here. Remember, Jesus had already appeared to all of his disciples, including Peter, and said, well, peace be with you. That's forgiveness. That's the announcement of forgiveness. This is something different. He's reinstating Peter. Uh, he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Who are the these? The other disciples. Um, why would that question hit a nerve for Peter? He remembers what he said. Yeah, what did he say? Uh, Even if all fall away on account of you, I will never leave you. He specifically, at the Last Supper, or at that last night, uh, told Jesus, all these, even if they wander away from you, not me. So there's a connection here. Uh, I think that's why Jesus starts off this conversation this way. Uh, Do you love me more than these? You said you did, but we know how that worked out. Do you still love me more than these? Uh, do you love me? Jesus asks. And Peter says, uh, yes, you know I love you. And Jesus says, feed my lambs. Babies. Yeah, the babies. Uh, then Jesus says a second time, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, you know I love you. And Jesus says, tend my sheep. Uh, the big sheep. And uh, more than just feeding. Caring for, nurturing, and taking care of. A third time, do you love me? And Peter, a little bit more emphatically, will say, uh, you know everything, Lord. Uh, yes, you know I love you. And then Jesus says, feed my sheep. And really, uh, we don't need to spend a lot of time on what, why did he say feed and tend and all that. Essentially, what he's saying to Peter is why? Feed your souls. Take care of my people, young and old. Give them everything they need uh, uh, spiritually. Uh, back to the original uh, miraculous catch. What did Jesus call Peter to do after that first catch of fish? After he knew, oh, get away from me, I'm a sinner. What call did uh, what did he call Peter to do? Call him. And do what? Fisher of men. Told him to be a fisher, a fisher of men. Follow me and be a fisher of men. What does he do after this uh, miraculous catch? He says, follow me and be a shepherd of his flock. And in some ways, uh, that's still the goal of the church, isn't it? Isn't the church, at, at this locally here, even at St. Paul's, don't we care for the sheep, the, the lambs who are already in the fold? Isn't that, don't we care for one another who already believe in Jesus, have eternal life and salvation? Don't we shepherd? Isn't there a shepherding going on here? But isn't there also a, a call to be fishers, to go out and catch others with the gospel, proclaim that gospel, to catch... You know, fish for men. So that's a twofold. It's, we might say that would be the outreach, fishing, and the inreach, uh, the shepherding. And just for your uh, information, I don't know if this came up in your homework or not, uh, but the word shepherd um, is actually the Greek word would be translated as pastor. Uh, pastor. And it's not just a pastor who shepherds, but that's what you called your pastors to do. On your behalf, tend 
uh, the sheep, feed the lambs, and do all of that. It's all of our work together, uh, but you've called your pastors uh, to do that on your behalf. And then Jesus tells Peter how he will eventually die. How is that? Yeah, with his hands outstretched. And that was a colloquialism? That mean, does that sound like a word? Colloquial, does anybody know what that means? Or is it is a fit? It's, it's a, a common expression. Uh, when he says, stretch out your hands, Peter knew exactly what he meant. That's the expression for crucifixion. Jesus says, you know, some people are going to lead you somewhere and stretch out your hands. So he's telling uh, Peter how he's uh, going to die. And then after he says that, uh, he says, follow me. Follow me. All right. There's somebody else standing nearby. The disciple uh, whom Jesus loves is standing nearby. Uh and is probably privy to this conversation with Peter. And Peter notices uh, John standing there and says, well, what about him? Now, when I read this, and I, I think others would see it this way too, I don't, I don't believe that Peter is asking, hey, if i got to take up a cross, what about that guy? What's he going to do? It's not a, a, a kind of a comparison. If i got to die for you, Jesus, what are you going to make happen to him? I don't think that's really... Because once again, as I've said, as you look at the Gospel of John and other uh, uh, Peter, uh, words of Peter, uh, there's a close bond between Peter and John. They're the pillars of the church from here on out. There's a close connection. So Peter's not uh, necessarily thinking in terms of, if i got to do this, then what's his punishment? Not punishment, but what's his call? It's not so much that. It's more like... Uh, I gotta go through this. What? What about John? You know, what's what's gonna to happen to my friend and my other friends as well? I think that's more of the uh, the attitude. And Jesus says, "If I want John to live a long life, so be it. Don't worry about that. Just follow me." Well, what is Jesus saying there? Uh, well, you're called to do what I called you to do. Uh, you you go where I tell you to go. And you serve the way I tell you to serve. And you care for other people, but don't spend your time worried about other people's work and what they should be doing or not doing, whatever. Uh, focus. Does that seem like it might apply to us today a little bit? Okay. okay. Yeah. And Jesus is, in a, in a gentle way, is telling him, I got John. I'm taking care of him. And if I want him to, to live forever, so be it. Don't worry about that. You just do what I told you to do. Feed my sheep, tend my lambs. But uh, in this in this passage, uh, the this is another kind of an interesting uh, thing at the end here. From that moment on, the disciples were thinking what about what Jesus had said? Yeah, the story began to circulate that Jesus uh, had told, uh, given John, he's going to live forever. So you kind of get a did you hear what Jesus said about John? Nope. John's never going to die. What? True story. <laughs> you have this uh, going around on the disciples a little bit. Uh, this, And notice where, at, uh, this is concluding the gospel now. So it's almost like John is telling the story to his, his, his disciples, whoever's writing this down. And, and everybody recognizes um, that this people are thinking about him as an apostle, that he's going to live forever. That's the story that's even circulating. From the time of uh, this uh, resurrection in Paris, some 60 years later, John's still alive. Uh, this is the disciple who is very witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. These are the last two, chapters, two verses of the chapter. This is the disciple. So whoever's writing this is saying, this is the disciple... Uh, the, the disciple, of course, whom Jesus loved, but also the one uh, that's behind, <coughs> behind Peter being told these uh, things. So the, the writer here is kind of pointing back to, to John, who is very witness about these things. This is a present tense verb, which means what? John is still alive. John, the one who is still testifying, still sharing uh, this, the disciple whom Jesus loved is still sharing this information that we're writing down. 
and, uh, and who has written these things. Not only is he sharing new information that we're currently writing, but he's also written other things. And he's referring here to the first uh, uh, 20... The, everything up until these last two verses. John's already written it down. Uh, and we know, this is that we part again, this is what I said before, it's more than likely his disciples, we know that his testimony is true. Now there are so many other things that Jesus did, were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Um, I kind of think, here's, here's your elder, your scribe, kind of writing this, and John's going, oh, there's so much more I could tell you. And I, and I suppose if... Um, if I did, the, 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 two, the libraries wouldn't even contain it. So this is maybe John talking out loud, and the writer just writes it like that. I suppose um, that the, there would be so many books. What do you think, Pam? How many libraries do you think we have? <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of libraries in the world. And this is a reminder for us that these four Gospels, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, are written for a specific purpose, but they don't tell us everything about Jesus. They don't tell us every miracle and every teaching. Uh, but God has revealed all that we need to know. It's sufficient to bring us to salvation. And what John is saying here, as an old man, John, at 90 years old or whatever he is, going, oh, three years, there's a lot more I could say and a lot more that could be written. And then he, um, this is the, 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 the conclusion to the last chapter. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Uh, so in these last two chapters, uh, John is um, essentially saying that these things were written. So much more could have been written. But don't worry about that. You've got all that you need to know uh, to make you wise uh, for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So this is the kind of the conclusion to the, to the Gospel of John. And he writes this uh, well after Peter had been stretched out on a cross, well after all the other disciples had died, and, and even some of the disciples' disciples, you know, whatever. He's, he's it in many ways. Uh, um, towards the end of his life, he writes this Gospel. Um, all right. There's a lot more I can say, but I won't. Any questions? You can fill the room with my other comments, probably not. <laughs> not worth recording. So. You got upside down. You got upside down. Right? Yes, yeah. The uh, oh, church historian, God. I think it was, uh, I don't know, it was Eusebius or Josephus, one of those historians said that he was crucified upside down. Upside down. Yeah, because he didn't want to be the same as Jesus. But. Okay, let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Gracious God, we do continue to give you thanks uh, for your holy word. The entirety of it, uh, from Genesis to Revelation, and especially this Gospel of John that we've spent so many weeks now uh, studying and becoming more familiar with, we thank you for this word uh, that always uh, points us to our sins and our need for salvation and clearly articulates for us through the inspiration of the Spirit, articulates for us and shares with us uh, the joy of our salvation, uh, that Jesus did everything in order that he might be a perfect sacrifice on the cross and he might rise again. He's done everything. Uh, to give us uh, forgiveness and eternal life. Help us to treasure this good news, but also to be about the calling that you have given to us, to care for one another in the church, uh, to tend and feed and nourish uh, in that holy word and through your wonderful sacrament of Holy Communion. Help us to uh, be present together and to care for one another as your family, but also to be eager uh, to go out and to fish, uh, to go out and to share your gospel with the entire world. Help us to never lose sight of that important uh, task uh, and calling that you have given to us. Continue to bless us as a congregation here at St. Paul's, uh, that we might be a blessing to the world. Uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.